Well, you're looking at the, the underlying causes of war, global economic instability, uh, and very bad decision making, uh, and the growth of fanaticism. Uh, we saw European fascism in the 1930s. We're seeing a continuing growth of the far right in Europe and the United States again. And, of course, uh, it's Islamic equivalent, fueled by economic dislocation and poverty. And uh, though we should be clear, though, that in any military confrontation today, uh, the United States has the overwhelming uh, supremacy. The United States and its allies account for almost all of the world's military capability, and the Chinese and the Russians uh, have negligible power. Uh, the Americans, indeed, if there was a war tomorrow, could quite likely destroy all of the Chinese and Russian armaments without even using uh, nuclear weapons, just using their uh, smart conventional weapons. But that, of course, is a nice plan. Uh, the reality is that you only have to have a few stashed away that the Americans miss uh, for there to be catastrophic retaliation. But the causes of conflict are, are growing uh, uh, greater by the day. And I think if you look back, we are, will next year be looking at the anniversary of the end of World War II, that the wartime generation essentially thought that the sort of economic policies we have today, that is global, uh, no global economic regulation at all of currencies or financial markets, that that was a recipe for world war and that the economic dislocation of the 1930s, which came about through lack of or global regulation of finance and economic markets producing mass unemployment, had produced fascism and war. And that is why the policies of uh, Maynard Keynes, uh, the great uh, Cambridge uh, don and uh, creator of, along with the Americans, of the post-war economic system called Bretton Woods, why they um, worked so hard to have currency regulation, financial, financial regulation, and frankly a mixed economy, a much more social democratic mixed economy than we have today. Not because they wanted fairness uh, for its own sake, but they saw that uh, without it, and without attention to mass unemployment in these other factors, you saw uh, the seeds of, uh, of fanaticism. And I think it is a, a real lesson for us today to realize that the policies of World War II have been forgotten. Uh, and indeed, students at Manchester University and elsewhere have to protest to get taught Keynes these days uh, because the uh, prevailing idea is that um, supposed free markets without regulation is the way to go. Uh, and only perhaps 1% of economics departments still teach uh, the economic policies that were brought about to prevent World War III and frankly have a good deal to do with why we've had comparatively little conflict these last 70 years. A political conflict about the Second World War that the Americans, particularly the American right, don't really want to remember. Uh, that uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who uh, is perhaps one of great America's greatest presidents, elected four times, uh, there is one uh, tiny uh, warship in the American Navy named after him and his wife, whereas uh, President Ford, who you may remember succeeded Nixon and was never elected to anything, uh, he gets an entire fleet of aircraft carriers named after him. Uh, which gives you some indication of how much to the right uh, America has shifted, that the policies of the New Deal at home and abroad have been, and which brought America's success in the war, uh, have been thrown aside on the altar of anti communism. And so America has become a much more, uh, American policy has become much more militarized since World War II. Uh, and though that the domestic, uh, uh, racial, and other tensions within the society, were being fought out in the 1930s, as sadly you can see them on the, the streets of St. Louis today. In the balances have changed, but the conflicts are um, of a similar type. And while racial progress has made a lot of ground on some issues, on the, the fundamental issues of economic policy, I think looked at from the perspective of the 1940s, the clock, clock has been turned back, not forwards. 
it's very easy for us to talk about uh, the nuclear weapons uh, and think, not think about uh, the future uh, uh, conflicts, not the cyber weapons, but uh, uh, the sort of Tom Cruise world of uh, micro robots uh, and nanotechnology. All of these are real um, possibilities. But again, the question, two questions are, one is that why is there, is, is there no global effort to uh, control uh, weapons? I mean, Ronald Reagan, Mrs. Thatcher, Gorbachev, all worked very hard to control weaponry. And I don't think one can say that Putin is a tougher customer than Joe Stalin and Brezhnev. He's in a much weaker position, and yet we don't anymore do uh, disarmament and arms control. Uh, and without it, we really have to say, well, we're going to not do anything about the existing technologies and nuclear weapons, and then have nothing to say about regulation of these uh, future technologies of cyber and, uh, and nano, for example. Uh, and they integrate. Uh, for example, uh, if you are North Korea uh, or uh, Iran and you really want to have a beef with America, then exploding the one or two nuclear weapons you have not on America, but in the upper atmosphere and knock out the satellites, then, you know, 50 years ago, well, without satellites, no problem. Today, uh, many, many communication satellites are not proofed um, against the kind of electronic blast that you would get from um, one nuclear explosion in the high atmosphere. Uh, so those are, uh, those are realities. Mm. Uh, and, of course... Companies and states are fighting computer wars, cyber wars, uh, pretty much on a continuing basis. The Chinese get a bad press, but you can be sure that uh, American intelligence, GCHQ, uh, are already uh, all over the Chinese and indeed the Russians. Well, I think the United Nations is a good re one of the major reasons we haven't had war, um, uh, global war. Uh, indeed, I, mean, I read a book, America, Hitler and the UN, about how the UN was created to win World War II and preserve the peace. And I think if you look at uh, our uh, uh, television channels today, uh, full of programs about World War I, um, if we really want to say, if since World War II, we had had no global institution, just the kind of uh, diplomatic uh, behind-the-scenes deals that existed uh, between um, the Kaiser and uh, the Tsar of Russia and so on, that if you think we had survived the nuclear age without a global institution like the UN, I think that's uh, an absurdity, really, that having that institution, having that talking shop, that safety valve, uh, has uh, provided a calming effect in international relations. But, of course, it's as only as strong as countries invest in it. Uh, the United Nations is weak because, for example, the uh, UK doesn't commit a single um, unit of its armed forces to be on standby to the Security Council, whereas even Winston Churchill, or I might say particularly Winston Churchill, uh, said that the Royal Air Force unit should be placed at the disposal of the Security Council as long ago as 1946. So you've got to say, well, if Churchill thought the RAF um, or parts of the RAF could be placed at the beck and call of the Security Council, uh, how come you know, his, his heirs in the Tory party have no such interest? And frankly, the answer is hubris. The answer is that overconfidence of the British and the Americans can run the world. Well, I think ISIS and bin Laden have shown them that uh, that actually is a, a very dangerous and false assumption.